just start by paying a tribute to my co-director, Cecily Spall, who's been responsible for all the most rigorous analysis and actually all the most credible interpretations um, in this project. Um, we've um, prepared a, a final report now, and um, it'll start its long journey towards uh, publication. So what I'm about to say represents our kind of latest thoughts on the sequence. However, I read the purpose of the meeting as being more about uh, Scotland in Europe and Europe in Scotland, and so I've tried to focus on that. I've given myself, I hope, just enough time uh, to bring you through the stages uh, which were manifested by the people at Port Mahomoc between the period around about 500 and around about 1100. Um, and then I was going to try and um, invite you to share with me some reflections on how this site itself reflects the ideological geography of Europe. That, that's been my own area of study for some, for some time now. And uh, I, I think that it's important to try and do this, although you will see there is a lot of guesswork involved. So here we are at um, Port Mahomet, and there's the Church of St. Coleman, and there's uh, one of these wonderful vistas which Ewan Campbell talked so movingly about uh, last night. The site was discovered uh, because of some stray sculpture, uh, and also because of this crop mark site, which you see here, this crop mark of a of a, a rectilinear enclosure, enclosing the possibly probably the Church of St. Coleman and an area of land uh, against the Dorlock Firth. And uh, we decided to excavate on as large a scale as we could because there was a problem, we, even though we didn't necessarily assume this was going to be a monastery, uh, there was a problem then in the 19, early 1990s of seeing any Pictish settlement at a reasonable scale. And this was an opportunity to do that. So around about three quarters of a hectare were opened up and excavated to the subsoil and also the church, which was redundant. We were able to excavate the inside of it and also record the standing fabric. Well, the story goes like this, that there is some stray early prehistoric material the first period of occupation is round about the 6th to 7th century. It has these elements. First of all, there are kissed burials, which were found in our excavations, obviously only the places where we dug, but uh, in our excavations are found under the church. They were found at the um, far end of the, um, this big area here, sector two. Um, there were round houses, three at the north end of the site, which is the top of the picture, and one at the south east end of the site here. There was a, a huge area of cultivation. All this area here was covered in ard marks, <coughs> cut through or into or under a pod saw. Um, this is a, a, a settlement as well uh, by what was then a marshy area running down in the middle of the, the valley here. Now this period is not necessarily <coughs> not proven to be any kind of a monastery. It has certain elite aspects which I shall draw your attention to in just a second. Now around about 700 to 800, a very short period, there was what I am terming a monastic experiment at Port Mahomoc. I'm certainly thinking that they were building something which was believed to be a monastery and was part of the big, big monastic project, which I will refer to in just a, just a second. And that period has produced the vast majority of the artifacts and the features and the structures that were turned up by our excavation. Cemetery, workshops, road, pool, 
than boundary walls, vellum working, metal working. And then that uh, establishment was raided and uh, a lot of it burnt down. The sculpture that had been manufactured during this monastic period, a lot of it was broken up and scattered as hardcore in preparation for the third period, period three, the ninth to the eleventh century. This is a change of direction for the community. They dedicate themselves now to manufacture and trading. And they are looking in a new direction and they're looking towards new associates. The fourth period is the medieval, which happens after a hiatus. And here the site becomes that of a parish church, the parish church of St. Colwell. It's accompanied by a village. Uh, they are busily engaged in fishing. They have massive mounds of shells. And then later in the 15th century, they make, um, they have iron foundries as, as iron working all over the area, the site and the graveyard. And also the burial restarts again in the parish church in the 15th century. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Middle Ages again, but just to say that the, um, the, the sequence that's been produced in the Middle Ages and from the Middle Ages right up to today uh, is an enormously interesting one. Um, and it's for another time. So here we are in period one, and the, the, one of its aspects, one of its um, uh, attributes is kiss burial. There is an example on the right. This is where they've been found. That's where the white arrows are pointing. And above that, you can see, above the road, you could see in this um, photograph of 19... 45, which popped up as these things sometimes do, um, you could see a lot of things looking rather like round barrows. Um, as we'll see in just a tick, uh, it, it's always been clear to us that the burials at Port Mahomet, the early burials at Port Mahomet, were, were already part of a larger cemetery because of various sightings of kissed graves that had been made over the years. Um, but it now seems that it might be a little bit more formal than that. And two of our kissed graves, we believe, um, something I have to talk to Adrian about, but I think we believe, uh, were actually also themselves burial mounds. That's the ones we, we excavated, flattened burial mounds. The map at the top there shows the extent of cultivation, all those little red hatched areas, are areas where there were these kinds of ard marks. They're not crisscrossy ard marks, they're straight or sort of wavy parallel arm marks. Um, insofar as I can tell, and it isn't well dated, it's perfectly possible to ascribe these to the first settlement at Port Mahomet rather than to say the earlier Bronze Age. There is a building that goes with them, <coughs> a circular building, and armed with, inspired by really Fraser Hunter's work at, at Burnie, I think we're able to convince ourselves that this represents settlement belonging to the uh, Iron Age, perhaps the late Iron Age, and perhaps going into the 6th and 7th century. So that's the forerunner of the monastery. Here's some of the um, waterworks they, they made, the cistern, roundhouse, and inside that roundhouse is a hearth, and there there's the first signs of craft work which suggests that there may even be some contact with what was to follow. There's an example of the things that have been recovered from that roundhouse, that's S11, or its vicinity, um, something looking a bit like a harness mount and three disc-headed pins. We have suggested a 6th, 7th century date for these. At this time, the peninsula, the Tarbuk Peninsula, has produced three main clusters of burial. One where Port Mahomet is and its neighbour, Balnebrook. One round Balantor uh, with its neighbours, Hilton and Shandwick. And one round Nick. And those burials are mainly 
casual sightings rather than formal excavations, with all the dangers that that has for jumping to conclusions. But I think the urns do represent burials of the Beaker period. I think the long kists are reasonably easy to recognize. But of course, what won't have been recognized are things like head box burials and to a less extent, I think, short kists. Now, that version of the Tarbot Peninsula accentuates its peninsularity by raising the sea level to show you <coughs> where these places are, and they are rather insignificant places. They are places where there was a beach or a haven, and they're also the same places, as you will have observed, which later attracted the great monuments of the Pictish era. So in the monastic phase, we have head box burials in the church with sculptured grave markers, we have vellum working at the north end of this sector, sector two, a big infrastructure creating a pond. And then in the south, this interesting building, uh, which is, is like sporum shaped and had metal working uh, associated with it. And then the enclosure ditches making that rectilinear enclosure. So to just put some of these things before you briefly, here are some of the grave markers sarcophagus, something looking quite architectural, and then on the right hand side is a sculptor's chisel. <laughs> These smaller pieces of sculpture are embellished by big cross slabs, and so far there are four that have been counted on the kind of minimum number of individual bases um, at uh, at uh, Port Mahoma, this is cross slab C. It's now quite well known. It has pit uh, fossils depicted. It has also had originally uh, an inscribed stone with a Latin inscription on the side of it. One of the famous casual finds which led to the discovery of the site in the first place. So evidence of vellum making consists of a small tank, uh, with probably which hides were washed. Um, many stone rubbers, um, very nice set of tools, Gugulinellum, some nice sharp knives, and above all, um, the find of large amounts of alkaline ash, which was uh, made by burning shells and burning seaweed, which has little tiny shells attached to it. This ash is significant because although there's certainly other working leatherworking going on at Port Muhammad, the question we had to address was whether some of this leatherworking would be for vellum. And so the, the idea of the, having the um, astringent is, is that you can tore the leather rather than tan it and therefore produce something clear uh, to write on. In the south, this amazing building is one of the places where they were making <laughs> metalwork in the um, 8th century. The building itself has a certain cachet. These are the kinds of things that we paralleled with the moulds and the studs. Um, we didn't find these, but the, the, we found the moulds and the studs. At the same time, the peninsula itself is developing and big monuments are being erected at Nig and at Shandwick and Hilton of Cadwall. Um, these look out onto different pieces of sea and suggest that by this time, by the end of the 8th century anyway, the peninsula of Tarbot um, is under the, um, the sound of the control of the monastic establishment. Now, there's an important aspect of this, which is that what will become extremely important in the argument that is to follow is the question of whether this establishment could make a surplus. In other words, the economic character of monasteries is something that um, I believe is very important if we're to try and deduce their role in the wider political agenda of Europe. If they're simply places where people go and hide away, then that doesn't make them players in the same way 
as wealth-creating centers would. Now, the economy as we have it seems to be very much geared on mature cattle. They dominate the formal record. We have enough cars to account for the vellum making, but the biggest group of, of material comes from mature cattle. Uh, it seems less likely that they ate it. They have pigs to provide meat. They have mm -hmm. barley in the way of grain. So these cattle probably could be, at least, the way in which surplus is generated. Now, not as cattle. Um, I, many years ago, I remember um, reading, in fact, uh, obsessing, I think, uh, Mike Spearman's thesis, where he looked at the origin of the economy, non-monetary economy, inside early Scottish boroughs. And there he produced the currency of the cattle hide as the best, the most likely commodification of material wealth. In other words, you need capital that you can store as well as, as, well as exchange. So my guess is that as the grazing uh, expanded with more donations, it was possible to turn that into more cows in a bigger herd and turn that into more hides and that into more areas of influence. Without that, you can't really acquire the raw materials you need. You can't even acquire the raw materials you need for metalworking. It's not going to come from the Tarbot Peninsula. So we need some economic motor, and that seems to me to be the most probable one. Well, after that, um, in round about 800, the place was attacked. All that red there shows what was burnt down, and on the right you can see uh, pieces of sculpture that were, were broken up broken up with, or with, a, with a kind of sledgehammer, very, very fresh breaks, and then scattered all over the ground. That was by no means the end. A very short hiatus, and then the settlement springs to life again, but in a new form. Now it has metal workers. Those metal workers are working in numerous halves. They're making pins, belt plates. They're not trying to make any church plate. And above all, they've got molds for weights which suggests that they're part of some wider trading community, community of exchange in the Murray Firth and North Sea area. That very brief excursus on what happened at the Homock um, allows me to uh, highlight these three main stages. A first stage, which looks like an elite community, it has men and women in it, um, and Second stage, which is monastic, burials just of men. Um, and the third stage, which is of manufacture and, and trade. And so the question I'm asking is, how does this reflect? Is it reflected by events in, in, the, in the continent of Europe, and particularly the ideological geography? Well, we have uh, a lot of discussion and a lot of theorizing about this, some of which you and Campbell referred to last night. And I think it can be summarized that there are two main trajectories towards urban life in Europe. There is in the north the trajectory starting way back now, thanks to the discoveries of the last few years only, with the, with the cult sites. These cult sites, such as Aguma and sort of Mulder and Walker and so on, are succeeded by beach markets and then by uh, in Wix or Emporia. This is, this is the uh, work of Lars Jorgensen and, and Dagfin Skriel, and they end up with the four named big Viking towns in, in the Scandinavian route. And then in Gallic Europe, there is another set of paradigms altogether where they are tracking the centers of power in the post-Roman period into the old Roman towns, making them into royal seats, and then acknowledging, if not accentuating, the importance of, of the monasteries, the equivalent of the cult site. These are the Christian cult sites, and from then the Roman towns are revived. Now the whole argument that's going on at the moment is really more about who is driving the who is, who is driving the, the, the rush to post-Roman uh, prosperity? Is it the elite? Is it the merchants? 
So we have, for example, Chris Wickham as a champion of the elite being the likely prime movers. Richard Hodges champions that as well. And then we have um, people like Lechford Skier and, and particularly Franz Hughes, who very sadly couldn't be with us, who's made some uh, really good suggestions about how it's possible for a group of uh, merchants, traders, uh, to create a nucleated and even urbanized settlements. And when successful, they are then joined by, by the elite. This is important because a lot of the discourse in Europe generally now still relies on this question about who is to make things change. And our period, the period we study, is the vital period for us trying to understand that at a basic level. Now, playing less of a role has been the monasteries. And that's something that I've been quite interested in because, after all, monasteries represent a very powerful and ideologically driven network. But they're not often or always associated with being <laughs> responsible for a rise in prosperity or for driving the creation or the recreation or the reinvention of the town. Well, the cult sites are now getting much better known, which, uh, which is really pleasing. Uh, there's some wonderful publications being made. This is, this is a opera. But just to make the point that these sites already have a mechanism for manufacturing souvenirs and for receiving gifts, uh, and as we heard just a minute ago. And so they have embedded in them, if you like, uh, the, the, the ability to become towns. They, they didn't really become towns, they stayed cult sites, but parallel to their existence and using some of their economic apparatus, other types of settlement sprang up. Now, the monasteries have a different origin, and it's a long, complex one, and it's very well documented. So it's uh, sometimes quite hard to, 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 to penetrate, yeah, sometimes quite hard to penetrate um, or to separate, let's say, the exegetical arguments, uh, the arguments about why monasteries are praying in the way they are and regulating themselves as they are from the economic arguments, why they are structured in the way they are and how they earn their living. That isn't also, that isn't always that evident. We also know that there are quite a few different directions from which monasticism could have got to Scotland. Um, traditionally, in the case of Pickland, we always look west and we always look ultimately to Ireland, and this may be, this may be the case. But for me, it's not the most important point. The point is that there, those journeys and those missions are all busy, busy creating networks, and that network's got to be made to, to work in another way. Now, this situation here in the 6th, 7th century is an attempt to map the ideological geography at, at that point. It's very well known to everyone that this period is astonishing in European history because of the enormous quantity and diversity of its monuments. And these monuments, if you are an archaeologist, are all themselves individual documents, individual books, speaking about the aspirations of the people who erected them. We would like to be able to translate them, we'd like to be able to hear this multitude of different voices. They're not reporting necessarily on their situation, but they may be reporting on what they'd like their situation to be. So it's interesting if they begin to occupy different zones, the cult centers, some of which we've been looking at, the monumental burial mounds, and here in green, the various types of Christian manifestations, some of them standing stones, which they also have, of course, in Scandinavia, uh, but most of them, and in that period, that er the early, the proto-monastic period. Now, when it comes to the 8th century, um, we look at what um, Joachim Henning has done as an archaeologist, and what he did was he looked for all the evidence for manufacturing 
in the Central European area and, uh, and, and, and where it was located. In other words, which kinds of settlements were promoting manufacture. And he produced the result that uh, in the beginning of the 8th century, manufacturing in the Central European area uh, migrated to monasteries. More and more examples could be found where monasteries were hosting manufacturing and output. Of course, it's paralleled by the Emporia. Um, Stefan Lebec has uh, documented, um, uh, using historical documents, what these monastic sites are up to in Central Europe. They are uh, trading, they are manufacturing, uh, they are sending merchants on missions, uh, mercantile missions, um, all over the continent. They are accruing vast vast amounts of wealth. And this wealth is partly turned into great objects stored in the treasury. All the work is done, ad maiorum dei in gloriam, all the work is done for the greater glory of God. But some of it does create wealth, and that wealth is then able to be reinvested. Now Henning's argument is that the monasteries entirely failed to create free trade. In fact, they prevented it happening by operating a kind of restrictive practice in the area where the monasteries were networked, not everywhere. But that, of course, set up immediately a tension in Europe, a tension, perhaps um, this red line will do the trick, um, a tension between uh, people who believed that you could dedicate your life to successful uh, commerce, adventuring, wealth creating, that made more possibilities, that made more happiness, and people who believed that it was best to uh, align what you did on earth with the strictures of heaven as, as received from the Bible, as received from the teaching of Jesus. And you shouldn't underestimate the power of these kinds of ideology. Large numbers of people act because of them. And if you have such a big difference, ideological difference in Europe, then some sort of tension is going to come from it. So I think it's worth placing us as a monastery, apparently a long way away from the, the centre of action, as a major player in that centre of action. And I would say the same about all the sites that have been mentioned so far, and all the sites in the Irish Sea, the Irish Sea province, if you like, has had has got much better credentials for being a player right really early on in this whole debate, this whole confrontation. If you go further south, and we, we, as we just did, um, I think the new maps that have been drawn of the Mediterranean interchange are beginning to put all the old debates about Piran and, uh, and Gibbon and who stopped the Roman Empire happening and so on. Those are all being uh, marginalized now because of the discovery of 8th century amphora and the fact that 8th century amphora are moving around the eastern Mediterranean and the Adriatic. Now this means that monasteries and others will continue to have access to Mediterranean goods and of course to the Umayyad Caliphate as well. And therefore we've got to try and stop making too many artificial boundaries. For example, as Mike McCormick has shown, the slave trade was, uh, you, had a, you had ready buyers in the caliphate, that's true, but you also had ready sellers, and those sellers also included the monasteries. They were not uh, against slaving, they were also involved in the slave trade. And so that big network, which is largely hidden, and a lot of it is hidden, in immaterial goods. That big network is happening. Now with the invention of stable isotopes and various other uh, types of um, scientific analysis, we are now in a position to start tracking this. And of all the recent discoveries, all the recent sites that have been mentioned so far, possibly this is the most important of the lot 
uh, Kamakia on the, on the Po Delta. Not an easy town to investigate because it's still a town. Uh, nevertheless, it's produced very good evidence for occupation in the 6th and 7th century and then expansion in the 8th century. To start with, they're sorting eels and sending them up the Po to the Lombard areas. But soon it becomes one of those entrepôts which um, the researchers of, of, of Dorstadt have rightly, I think, compared to their own Dorstadt. It's like a Dorstadt at the other end of Europe. It is. It is. And because it wasn't known about a few years ago, let's not be too dogmatic then about what we are prepared to believe, uh, not only about Europe in the 8th century, but Scotland too. Thank you.